some people have a fear of public speaking. Various levels of stage fright that can range from stuttering during presentations to freezing up the moment they see the audience before them. I suffer from a similar condition, except that I have a fear of public existing. Anytime I'm out in public, whether it's going out for a walk or to get the mail, I invariably succumb to an extreme fit of nervousness and overwhelming anxiety that makes every movement physically laborious. This feeling deepens, it intensifies each person present in the immediate vicinity. It's literally debilitating. Now, this peculiar condition isn't baseless in origin, but I didn't simply wake up one day inexplicably afraid of crowds, nor was I born with some sort of genetically inherited predisposition towards shyness when I was a teenager. Now, I, I was pranked, harshly. School bully, he applied his tortures generally targeting everyone with equal malice, and decided one day to slip some laxatives into my ground beef tacos. Now, I love tacos, okay, and all dishes with Mexican cuisine. Being a hungry teenager, I didn't examine my tacos for foreign contaminants. I had no reason to. I ate it quickly, ravenously, oblivious to the devilish snickering happening around me. After five minutes in line for another taco, Mom had supplied me with extra money that day, just for that occasion, well, I felt the laxatives kick in, and my bowels were primed to deliver a molten mess. I uh, didn't even make it out of the lunchroom. As if the school staff responsible for setting up the lunch tables had collaborated with the bully, I couldn't, I couldn't weave through those island-like obstructions fast enough. And halfway across the room, I lost control in the worst way possible. It shot out of me audibly down the shorts. It was, unfortunately, summer. With a sickening squelch splattering the floor, I I wouldn't have made the lunchroom quieter if I had self-immolated. All eyes turned to me, and the most mocking, heart-sinking laughter arose, laughter that rang aloud in my head for days, weeks, months afterwards. Thankfully, as I mentioned before, the equality-minded bully soon set his sights on a new target, and while no one ever forgot that I shit myself, other people, other poor souls, were similarly embarrassed and socially ostracized. So that's why I feared going out in public for the last ten or so years. And yet I never lost my love for tacos, burritos, enchiladas, carne asada fries, etc., all those delicious combinations of spicy meats, cheese, vegetables, carbs. Luckily, I managed to secure a post-high school job that not only paid well, but allowed me to work from home. The home being the living quarters within the compound of the facility they employ me. My work isn't really important to the story that I have to tell. I monitored and logged things and sent the data to someone else within the compound-wide network. They did with it what they do. I was able to live my life without direct contact with anyone, and while we were obviously allowed to leave the compound whenever we wanted, I barely had a reason to. My parents aren't in the picture, and all my friends were a click away. I got my groceries and any other necessity items delivered. Life was simple. It was comfortably modern, undisturbed, unobserved. Or so I thought. Now, due to my dietary habits, I mean, not just Mexican, but like all spice-laden foods, I often relieve myself of gas throughout the day. I do not believe I suffer from any actual conditions of gastrointestinal weakness or sensitivity, and neither do I think that I am addicted to the previously mentioned foods. I just think that, without the social pressure to refrain from passing gas, I've grown accustomed to doing it whenever. I'm sure the average person would fart a lot more if they, you know, hadn't been ridiculed for it. Well, because I'm accustomed to doing it, going outside to retrieve the mail, the only thing I bizarrely can't have brought to my door is an emotionally harrowing experience. The mail is housed within a large room delivered to the specific slot of the residence. We must retrieve our mail ourselves using the key provided to us upon accepting the employment. Now, ordinarily, I can manage the trip there and back without too much trouble. A bit of sweating, slight quickened pace, a brief uptick to the heart rate, but if there's another person there, well, it, it feels like it becomes a matter of life and death. You know, a dire, faded journey to retrieve an item whose importance diminishes with each person I happen to spot on the way there. I've forsaken my mail countless times, just because someone's been walking in a direction entirely different from my direction. 
The worst part is that lately, there seems to always be someone around, some resident or faculty worker who pops into my site just as I'm entering the mailroom, or sometimes before. And since last month, I've been forced to retrieve my mail daily, after a compound-wide notice was issued that residents are not to neglect their mail due to the small capacity of the slots. But thankfully, the facility's administration was kind enough to not point me out. Although the mailman, who elicits the same feeling in me as everyone else, started giving me dirty looks whenever he passed by. To, to cope with this mandate of forced mail retrieval, I started listening to music, using the noise to cancel out the sounds of footsteps, which always alert me to the presence of another person. I had nothing to help with a visual detection. I still needed to see. While this was a good idea on paper, it had unforeseen and disastrous consequences two weeks ago. I grabbed my mail, and I was halfway home when the music in my ears betrayed me. I had a beef, chorizo, egg, and salsa burrito for breakfast, a truly delicious combination that was, of course, an intestinal powder keg, so it was a good day. I chose music I could really get into, something that was loud and wild enough to really capture and hold my focus. I was so into it, so mentally immersed in the song, that I briefly forgot to monitor the other functions of my body. Perhaps the 30 meters from my apartment, I let one rip. Didn't hear it, couldn't have, not with the music blaring through my earphones, but I felt it, and the feeling alone filled me with an immediate and powerful dread, because I knew, I knew in some dim way that there were others around. When I saw the first person walking around the corner, face contorted into a mixed expression of amusement and confusion, I lost the little control I had retroactively applied to that area. I don't know if the nervous farting is a normal thing, but for me, in that increasingly awkward moment, it was. Thankfully, my nerves had denied me the ability to walk, so I at least made progress towards my apartment as gas continuously slipped out. But with nearly every step I took, people popped into view, as if summoned by some fart alarm, conjured by some incantation of flatulence. I got to the point where I had a small crowd following me and a greater crowd converging towards me before I finally managed to enter my apartment, lock the door, and unleash the full extent of my gastrointestinal fury. Weirdly, the crowd dispersed almost immediately after I had made it inside. But there was a murmur, a few stifled laughs, but nothing remotely close to the almost diabolic chorus of laughter I'd experienced all those years ago in school. I was exhausted, physically and emotionally, and curled up into a ball on my couch. While the experience was certainly mortifying, it had also been odd. I wasn't able to exactly understand why until I logged onto the facility's network later to do some work. After completing my daily report to send up the chain, I happened to glance at the list of online users and, on a vague impulse, expanded that list to view all the facility's personnel. I stared at this list for a while, growing increasingly unsettled with time as I scanned the series of names. There were 28 people in total on the list. There had been at least 50 people following me earlier in the day. Somehow almost double the compound's capacity had converged upon me in the incredible span of only a few moments. Something wasn't right. I went to sleep, or at least put myself to bed, with the suspicion that the facility was harboring secrets, that there was more to its research than it let on. In the morning, after a mostly restless night, I logged onto my computer and began the day's work, and I was met with quite a shocking sight. The personnel list had grown from 28 to 54. I scrolled through the list, recognizing only half the names there, while the other were entirely unfamiliar to me. The department in which these new phantom users worked were real departments, although because I had never physically visited them, I hadn't had any reason to. I, I couldn't verify whether or not the persons listed within them actually worked there. Even more surprising was the fact that I hadn't received any emails about the previous day's incident, nor had there been any compound-wide notices or bulletins posted. It was as if the near-instantaneous gathering of the entire compound's personnel hadn't happened, as if my incredibly embarrassing, gaseous attack hadn't happened. I rarely have need to directly communicate with other network users. I simply download assignment packets, upload my log data through a server so I didn't have anyone that I could casually talk with about the bizarre incident or apparent lack thereof. 
They are general forums for discussing common issues, communicating new protocols and other universally useful information, but nothing that would have been appropriate places to address or investigate what happened. Unsettled, confused, and perhaps even afraid, though I couldn't at the time decide why, I left it alone and went about my day. During one of my leisurely walks, as mandated by the faculty's exercise initiative, another bizarre thing happened. I typically stray from the usual walking paths. They wrap around the compound, and instead I venture into the flat, pseudo-desert expanse of barren land beyond the facility's perimeter, a place where, for the first two years of my employment, I had yet to see another soul explore. But two days after the incident, during a normal walk, I felt that age-old urge to relieve myself. I had leftover goat curry for lunch. Not, not having any reason to refrain from doing it, I let gas slip, and before the whistle had even ceased, a woman suddenly entered my peripheral vision, jogging a few meters away towards the limits of the expanse, at which lie a rarely trafficked highway. Dread flourished anew, and I forcibly stopped the gaseous flow, despite there still being a few puffs to let out. The woman glanced in my direction, and my soul froze over as I noticed her vacant ears devoid of earphones. Yeah, she'd heard the roar. I quickly turned away, mortified beyond measure, and made my way back to my apartment. But along the way, people seemed to pop up with their truly disconcerting suddenness, emerging into view like wooden pop-ups in a shooting gallery. I made eye contact with no one, but kept a mental count of each person I passed, and by the time I had arrived at my apartment, the count had reached 43. Considering the time of day, it was extremely odd that there were that many people out and about, especially since that many of the compound's occupants were responsible for data logging, and essential operations that could only be conducted during the day. Once again, within the ostensible privacy of my apartment, I sat before my computer and, having no other recourse, emailed my supervisor with a question. Something I hadn't done since my first week on the job. My question had been simple, straightforward, and yet, his response was very vague, almost elusive. My subsequent conversation only served to worsen my anxiety, and even inspired actual fear by the time it had reached its conclusion. Here's the transcript. Hello, I know it's unusual for me to be emailing you, considering the lack of communication between us since my initial onboarding, but I cannot think of anywhere else to turn. Recently, I've noticed what I can only describe as strange and unprecedented behavior from my colleagues here. Behavior that seems focused on me. It seems as if I'm being unduly monitored, or at least persistently followed, by nearly the entirety of the available staff. I've checked the personnel list and have noticed an increase in the users listed, nearly doubling the amount. I wasn't made aware of any hiring event and there was no notice of orientation dates or announcements of department restructuring. Do you have any idea of what's going on and why I seem to be the center of all of it? Supervisor, there's no need to worry. The faculty's operation cannot be fully understood by a single individual, and rarely does the administration bother to dispense information pertaining to the grander aspects of our work. Do not worry. Operations are going well. You and your work is being reviewed positively. While I am glad to hear that I'm performing my duties adequately, I do not see what that has to do with the fact that I am being followed whenever I go around errands and walks. As my immediate supervisor, surely you must have some idea of why I'm receiving this special and admittedly discomforting attention? Supervisor, it is okay. The situation is being monitored. Data is being recorded and passed along to necessary analytical teams. No observation is wasted. You're performing well and needn't alter your behavior in anticipation of any modifiers. If you have any further questions, please consider keeping them to yourself and resuming your daily tasks. End of transcript. In only about 10 minutes, my anxiety had blossomed into full-blown panic. My supervisor had clearly been withholding information, and while he was right, I didn't have any entitlement to information regarding the grander scheme of operations, I was still nonetheless owed an explanation for why my privacy and personal space was being intruded upon by strangers. Terror can drive people to do stupid, impulsive things. They believe that in doing so, they will save themselves from whatever is causing them stress or posing a threat to their life. My terror drove me to try something that was, for me, completely unheard of. When the day came around to order groceries, 
I requisitioned sandwich materials, fruits, cereal, and juices. Nothing that'd be a major intestinal irritation compared to my usual spicy and cheesy diet. For an entire week, I produced very little gas, and I was still hounded with only the faintest persistence of subtlety by other residents. Followed closely wherever I went, as if my pursuers hoped to catch me off guard, farting my heart out. There was an air of aggression throughout the compound, at least when I was outside to perceive it. Halfway through the week, my supervisor even contacted me, saying that I should resume activity as usual for the continued operational efficiency of the facility and your own personal safety. Even though I hadn't deviated from my daily habits or my actual work in the slightest way, only my diet had changed, and the visible effect this change had upon the community was evidence enough that I was being closely un unfairly monitored for an extremely strange reason. The suggestion that my well-being would be put at risk only served to increase my anxiety about the circumstances and deepen my distrust of my employers and colleagues. I hoped they'd eventually leave me alone, find another subject to harass and monitor, sort of like how the school bully had moved on to another victim after ruining my social standing. This hope was crushed, however, on the final day of my grocery allotment. A food truck pulled into the facility, bearing the sign that read, Tacos, Burritos, and more. Cheap, cheesy, meaty, and spicy. An event that had never, in the history of my employment, happened before. Coeval with the arrival of the truck was the sudden closure of the mailroom, right before I could step inside and retrieve a package I'd been anticipating. There was allegedly an unforeseen plumbing issue, and the mailroom needed to be drained of water. I'd been just about to walk inside when the mail attendant stopped me and informed me of the dubious situation. When I turned around, I came face to face with the accursed food truck and its sign, which seemed to advertise specifically to me. There were, of course, others around. And while it had been a warm day, it was obvious that their visible precipitation was owed to an anxious anticipation of my behavior, rather than the heat. They were waiting to see what I'd do, since I had, for the entire week, not let out even the smallest, softest puff of gas in a public space. But embarrassment and terror had endowed me with a pernatural sense of self-control, a, a psychological resilience to that culinary predilection that I had indulged in without abstinence my entire life. I walked right past the truck, noticing even the driver's eyes and eerily welcoming smile follow me as I ignored the scents of spiced meats and steamed rice. Unfortunately, this was the final straw for the facility. A crowd gathered behind me as I strode away, dropping performance of absent-mindedness and casualness. They pursued me with clear intent, marching along in ranks, silent and grim-faced. Doors opened as I passed them, and from each exited at least one person who joined the trailing army. When I rounded a corner, I was met with a wall of people, their faces sternly set, their arms crossed before them with syringes gripped tightly in their hand, cut off, hemmed in a row after row of familiar faces and complete strangers, well beyond the 50-plus I had encountered earlier. I could do nothing but await the fate that was being forced upon me. No one spoke. But a moment later, the food truck careened around the corner and the wall before me briefly parted to allow its passage. The food harboring vehicle came to rest right in front of me. And the smells from within wafted out deliciously, intoxicating. Wordlessly, an arm extended from the window and in its hand was a burrito bloated with savory contents and dripping with grease. The eyes of the man who offered it were darkly shaded by the cap he wore. Though his mouth was visible, and the smile that had been there only moments ago was now an unsettlingly severe frown. Fearing a fate worse than the one presented to me by the driver, no good can come from the forcible injections by an ominously gathered crowd, I took hold of the proffered burrito. The weight was almost staggering. It was truly an attestation to the chef's strength that he had managed to hold the thing outstretched for even a few moments. Gripping it with both hands before an audience of perhaps 100 demonically faced people, I bit into it, tasting the ultra-palatable combination of meats, vegetables, cheeses, and sauces. Against myself, I ate the entire thing with more fervor than a starving wolf would consume a fresh kill. I tore into the tortilla like a mortally dehydrated man might tear into a plastic-wrapped case of bottled water. 
When I was finished and my fingers had been licked clean of the juice, I looked at the crowd, following what they expected to happen next. Their face was all full of deep satisfaction of fulfillment that went beyond having witnessed an entertaining event. Happiness is too light of a word to describe their expression. Scientific ecstasy is more befitting description. I realized that the truth of my professional purpose within the compound, the work I did was inconsequential, unimportant. The real data I contributed to the facility was my output of farts and the resultant emotional turmoil generated within me when they were witnessed in public settings. Like the streams of data that I oversaw and reported, my gaseous streams were similarly studied. My mortification initially induced, charted, and evaluated for some gross, cryptic purpose. Left without options and utterly exhausted by the relentless harassment and frightening pursuits, I gave them what they wanted. I gave them more than what they wanted. The fart swelled to truly immense sonic proportions, drowning out even the rumbling of the truck's engine. I held nothing back, allowing myself to produce more than I ever had before, aiding not only by the quickly digested burrito, but by the farts I had withheld throughout the week. The abdominal pressure releasing in a great, tumultuous thunderclap that shook cheeks and polluted the immediate atmosphere with an olfactory, debilitating stench. The crowd, unprepared for and revolted by the momentous fart, immediately dispersed, some fleeing to the buildings from which they'd come, others running mindlessly, unable to think clearly amidst the chaos of my gaseous outburst. No longer surrounded, I continued my flatulent bombardment whilst weaving in and out of buildings, and when I finally reached my apartment, I gathered together what belongings I could carry and then left the building and headed for the parking lot. But there were small crowds of people huddled around all brandishing syringes, all mean-faced and watching, though none of them converged on me for fear of being crop-dusted. I even saw my supervisor as I reached the part of the lot wherein my car sat. He tried to get my attention, waving towards me for a vacant corner of the lot, though I knew that he'd only try to restrain me or distract me while someone else rushed in to subdue me. His face bore a smile, though it was obvious that it was insincere. His feigned kindness and act to mask the vehement within. There was no syringes in his hand, but his posture was one of confrontational readiness. Upon reaching my car, I let rip a final triumphant rearward discharge, scattering the few brave souls that had dared to attempt my capture at the last moment. I then drove out of the lot and left the compound without looking back. I have no intentions of going back until I receive answers. I promise that they'll cease monitoring my bodily functions and dietary habits. It's a well-paying job, and while their attentions may be nefarious, it is nonetheless the only viable option for employment that I have, considering how they were able to muster up such a sizable force of people within what felt like a short moment's notice. I won't be disclosing the name of the company, lest they use their apparent power and influence to silence me. I want to remind you guys that I also do narrations over at Chilling. The Chilling app is available for Android, iPhone, and if you'd like to get your hands on the Chilling app and hear myself as well as many, many other narrators, and they have a whole new setup where you can watch movies on there now, and it's also free to try out with ads now, so you don't have to get a subscription like you used to before. You can actually just get the app, you can start watching, you can start watching on your PC. It's evolved so much since the last time I have updated you guys on this, and sincerely, it's a great place if you want to see more horror, especially if you like horror audio. So strongly, strongly suggest you check out the Chilling app. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, 
Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.